I'm very pleased to introduce to you our dean, uh, Dean David Levy, who as really needs no introduction except to say that he was a federal judge and he likes things to happen on time, as do I. As you'll see later as the conference goes on, we, we will really work very hard to keep everything on time. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, allow me to turn it over to the dean right away to give you a few welcoming remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you very much. Congratulations, uh, Professor Dunlap. Uh, once again, this is our yearly lens conference, and uh, this looks to be the biggest and the best ever. Uh, this is the largest number of registrants that we've had uh, for, for lens. There are more active duty registered uh, here at this conference than ever before. Thank you for coming. We have 50 students from uh, the law school and around campus who are here, uh, so you might uh, Make an effort to talk to them, please. Uh, the title of the conference is Hybrid War Equals Hybrid Law? Question mark. And we thought that lawyers were not quantitative. Uh, it's an equation. Um, I am given to understand that hybrid war is the highly integrated use of a diverse range of military and non-military measures in pursuit of an overarching strategic objective. And this conference will address the impact of this concept of hybrid war uh, on the law and whether or not the hybrid war concept can be addressed within existing legal regimes. The conference will consider uh, the law of war, surveillance and privacy, uh, autonomous weapons, civil military relations, and developments in regulating cyber incidents that fall below the threshold of force. Uh, Professor Dunlap and others uh, who've put this conference together have assembled uh, an amazingly distinguished and varied group of panelists and speakers uh, from the government, from the military, from across the university, from NGOs, and from the law school. Uh, I'm so glad that you came here on a bright and sunny day after the tornado passed through, uh, which was our weather's own form of hybrid war, um, and uh, I know this is going to be a great conference. Thank you. Welcome to Duke Law School. You, well, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I want to run through some administrative matters, a uh, little bit of an orientation. Uh, you've seen where the reception is. That's where you are relative to the rest of the law school. The restrooms, all important, especially for those of us who are over 50 years of age. Make, make a note of that. And that's where you, many of you probably came in, Science Drive, and you can see where the Science Drive parking lot is. Emergency exits, there's down in front here, and as well as around other parts of the building. Uh, smoking, uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> if you're really desperate, We've made it particularly humiliate, I, difficult, I meant. Uh, you go outside, there is actually a designated smoking area outside if you go through the courtyard and down towards the back. We do have an overflow room. I'd ask you to consider that if you want to spread out some more, if you're late coming back to a session, if uh, you need to leave a session early, or, uh, and if you are, you can participate. We're going to have a live VTC, and some people go to the overflow room for a while and then come back, uh, and so forth. And our student volunteers, please, please stand up. I want to embarrass her. She has this little, and all the volunteers will have are identified that way. Uh, Wi-Fi. If you use, if you're using Wi-Fi, look for visitors. It should. It doesn't actually. I thought it said Duke visitors, but I, it just says visitor on there if you look in your browser. Uh, this is something I'm going to have to do as soon as I sit down, let's turn off my cell phone. And um, please be back in your seat exactly on time. The, those veterans of this conference know we start exactly on time. And uh, please be conscious that we do have classes going on. Uh, and I know it's easy to get very loud in, in the hallway there, but uh, just be conscious of that. I'd be grateful. Just so you know, um, we are going to video the conference as well as we have two photographers 
Pete, if you could stand up. And uh, Shannon, uh, be taking, taking photos. I do want, and speakers, especially our governmental speakers, it's important that they understand, uh, that everyone understands what the uh, uh, rules are, that they're just speaking for themselves and, and no one else. And as I say, this is especially important for our governmental uh, speakers. A CLE, we've, uh, and I can't explain this, Pennsylvania has given us 10.5 hours, including two hours of, of uh, ethics. And North Carolina, which we just literally got yesterday, approval, takes two months in North Carolina, um, two hours of ethics. And uh, I do want it, if you do want CLE, there's a sign-up table. I don't care what your state is, we want everybody who is uh, wanting CLE to please sign in. And um, we are going to try to have questions for most of our panels and our speakers, uh, but you know, the operative word here is question as opposed to statement or expression of philosophy or dissent or whatever it may be. Uh, but there will be plenty of time for that because we'll have breaks and especially those who are coming to the reception and dinner tonight. Uh, and, you know, the speakers, most of the speakers this year are going to stay here for the entire conference. So you'll have opportunities to interface with them during the breaks and so forth. We, we do want feedback. Uh, you can give it to me instantly if there's something that you don't like. Uh, send me an email. I'll ignore it. No, I'll, I'll take action immediately and, uh, and we'll try to make it, make it right. And afterwards, there is going to be a survey that will go out to you. Uh, a little bit about our conference team. A lot of you have interfaced with Stephanie. Uh, this year, a little bit differently than previous years, I put Stephanie in charge of weather. I was in charge last year, and suffice to say, I didn't do a great job. Uh, Victoria Zelfro, my assistant, has been tireless in working on this. We've had a, our media team, and we've had a web team. Now, Jennifer, a lovely lady, but she absolutely did not want her picture to be shown. So instead, I'm showing you what she did for us and completely revamped our website and set up our blog. And I hope that you take a look at our blog and maybe subscribe to it. It's called Law of Fire. Hmm, wonder where that came from. Um, our tech team in, in the back, uh, making this magic happen, and our photographers who've been introduced to you. <laughs> That's a good picture. What's wrong with that picture? And our, our volunteers. These are our student volunteers. There's, with one exception, my, actually my favorite volunteer is not a student, uh, <laughs> but be that as it may. And of course, uh, Judge Scott Silliman right down front, who uh, actually uh, was, created the conference along with uh, Robinson Everett uh, founded the center and continues to be the, the guiding light. And fortunately, uh, he's been able to join us uh, today. Our board, uh, we do have a board of uh, uh, different professors from the law school and around the university as well as from UNC. And our founder, I always like to talk about Robinson because this would not exist. He had the vision to see the, to see the, the role of national security law and the importance of the education, and it's just an irreplaceable part of our heritage. And our benefactor uh, of the Robinson Everett Trust. And interestingly enough, we've been trying for this for three years to, to get a, you know, a level, what we call a level um, donor, and we have our first, uh, Mr. Rob Spring, uh, is a silver level donor. And that was really important to us because Number one, we didn't have to increase the cost of the conference. Number two, we didn't have to put a cap on military attendees as we, as we have in previous years, meaning uh, waiving the attendance fee. And in, in addition, and particularly, we didn't have to raise the cost of the, of the dinner. So he really made a, a big difference. And he enabled us to invite our first overseas guest on, on my watch, and you'll get to meet him on the next Oh, well, people keep saying to me, Charlie, 
how can I donate to the center? You're not giving me enough information. I go over and over, you know, you're not doing a good job. And in fact, oh, oh, jeez, I just got, I just got, you know, that instant Dunlap, you've got to do a better job in giving this information about how to donate. Okay, well, here it is. And there, they'll, you, that capability is out there. There's letters, there's envelopes, and so forth. Special guests, I want to, you know, thank all the members of the Armed Forces. And I, what I would ask you and the students in attendance, and in fact, everyone to do, is to introduce yourself to each other, because I think this is a great opportunity for young people to meet other young people who are doing uh, something that is directly related to, to national security. And as I say, uh, let's, one of the reasons the big value of an in-residence conference, meaning uh, in person, is the opportunity to meet each other. So let's introduce ourselves to each other and get to know each other. That's a big part of it. Uh, and in that connection, I want to just uh, thank a, a group from Florida Coastal School of Law, uh, we have a whole group of them down here, uh, drove up how many hours? Seven hours to be with us today, and, and that's just terrific. And that's the kind of synergy that we've always hoped to come out of the conference. We're, this is really a special event. We're going to have three book signings of our, of our um, panelists and participants. And this is really a rare opportunity to get a signed book, but also to actually meet the author and chat with them about their work. That will be today between 1,200 and 1,500. So, uh, you know, take advantage of that. Any questions? Well, let's go ahead and, and get started. Uh, Ken? Our uh, opening speaker is uh, you know, one of my mentors, I have to say, Ken Anderson from uh, American University, or the, the Washington School of Law at American University. And those of you who have been in this, uh, this area of the law for a while, Ken Anderson is well known to you. Uh, the thing about Ken is that he is one of the most thoughtful thinkers about, and innovative thinkers about national, and in fact, international security law. And he's agreed to... Um, open our conference, and really what he's going to be doing, I think, posing some questions and, and try to create a framework for this concept that we're talking about of hybrid threats and what does that mean for the law. Uh, the bios of all our panelists and speakers are, are in your uh, program. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that except to say that I, can, I, I can't tell you how pleased and honored I am that, that you fit this into your schedule. Trust me, he is not an easy guy to get a hold of. Uh, but here he is, Ken. Thank you so much. Well, I am absolutely delighted to be here. And Charlie, thank you for that very generous um, introduction. And I'd say the mentor part is actually the other way around. Um, I wasn't aware there was a hurricane um, until I went to the airport in Boston last night. Uh, whatever it was in the air. Um, I bet you were wondering if I was going to make it. You were, okay. Um, as Charlie said, my role here at the very beginning of the conference is to talk about one of the two uh, driving concepts for this entire meeting. We have on the one hand the question of hybrid threats that I'll also refer to as hybrid war, hybrid warfare, hybrid conflict. Um, operative word there is hybrid. Uh, and the second concept, hybrid law, um, in the sense of in what ways does uh, the legal side of all of this have to respond to whatever this hybrid is about. I am not going to be addressing the law parts of this. Um, I'm actually going to take the minutes that I have here in order to try and explore, uh, and I think for those who don't follow this on a daily basis, to try and sort of lay the table for what it is we mean by hybrid in this discussion. Uh, and in order to do that, I'm going to just kind of back up to um, some things that are really quite descriptive and just trying to give people a sense of where uh, the debate comes from and uh, what contours it's had in the last few years. 
uh, move from there on into some of the internal critiques, meaning within military circles here in NATO and other places, uh, that have been raised about the concept itself, and asking questions, in effect, how explanatory is this? Uh, what does this actually do for us as a concept in terms of understanding the uh, nature of conflicts that are on the horizon, conflicts that are with us currently? Um, and is there actually ways in which that could either be improved or uh, perhaps move to alternative ways of understanding it? And then third, I want to move to um, something that presents hybrid in a slightly different form. Uh, that presents it as something that is not, as we'll see, about methods or ways of conducting conflict, um, but rather looks to try and understand the ends to which some of these hybrid conflicts um, have been and are being conducted. So we'll proceed sort of in those three, and part of the purpose here really is to just kind of get a description of one part of this on the table. Um, in order that we've got some common ground for people that are coming from many different backgrounds here. So when we talk about hybrid threats, hybrid warfare, um, I want to just read a, a definition of this that comes out of um, uh, an essay in the um, War on the Rocks uh, journal uh, online. And it says this, Europe is now a petri dish for hybrid war. Events of the past decade, not to mention the last few years, have reaffirmed the value of a concept that sought to explain a range of diverse, coercive instruments across the operational spectrum of war. Hybrid warfare is a term that sought to capture the blurring and blending of previously separate categories of conflict. It uses a blend of military, economic, diplomatic, criminal, and informational means to achieve desired political goals. Uh, and I think that's actually a pretty decent descriptive definition of what hybrid means in this context. Now, it refers to the blurring and the blending of previously separate categories of conflict, but as the second, the last sentence of that uh, adds to that, it winds up saying it's not just categories of conflict in the military sense of military means of waging war. Uh, it adds to that a whole range of things that would be thought, um, not necessarily in a strictly legal sense, but things that you'd think of as being civilian in nature, propaganda, disinformation, uh, and a core component of that being the use of the internet, um, the web, social media, and uh, things like that, um, that may or may not be a part of what we would traditionally consider to be um, war. And the question is, uh, to whom are these tools available, so to speak, the ability to bring these uh, not so much in the past combined categories together. And the answer is really to both sides in the conflict, but the way in which it plays out in the current debate is largely that it is the weaker actor in a conflict that is in some way attempting to uh, compensate for its conventional weaknesses on the battlefield by drawing into it different uh, aspects. Uh, different tools that are uh, intended to, in some ways, neutralize what those others are about. Um, now, the discussion within, let's say, military planning, strategic uh, political circles, particularly within NATO, uh, has tended to focus the discussion of hybrid conflict on, pretty naturally, Russia in the Crimea. Right. So Russia and Ukraine seen as something in which uh, Russia has deployed a very skillful range of um, tools uh, across social media, across the use of the internet, across various kinds of cyber attacks in the course of engaging um, in what ultimately is a very, very traditional military and political and strategic goal, the annexation of territory. Now, it's important 
you know, towards the end of this um, uh, discussion, I'll raise the question of the ends and how we can sort of think of hybrid in terms of what the goals are of actors in conflicts. Um, but for now, I think what's important to understand is that the goal that Russia has had, as we've talked about its means and methods and hybrid ways of pursuing it, is really actually an extraordinarily traditional one. Um, namely, go into your neighbor's territory, grab a chunk of their land, find ways in which you can declare it to be your own. And it uh, will get discussed, I think, at length later on, uh, how it is that that's, well, it's kind of illegal. Right? I, mean, I think that's the <laughs> word we're looking for here. Um, and yet, it's elusive. Right? It's hard to quite get your hands on it, and the reasons are Russia says that it didn't do any of that stuff. Use of proxy forces, the use of civilian militias, paramilitaries, uh, forces that you deny having control over. Uh, it engages in cyber attacks of various kinds and then says, who, us? Us do such? We have no capabilities of that kind. So the ability to engage in activities that promote deniability, the inability to attribute responsibility, bland denials of what it is you're actually doing, and at the level of legal discourse, I guess better said sort of political legal discourse uh, in the international sphere, uh, denial that you're doing something that we'd otherwise call the taking of territory by conquest. Right? And that makes it quite difficult because we aren't then quite in the same position of calling out the champions and saying we're going to war over this. And it has been pointed out uh, repeatedly when it comes to Russia and the Crimea that the actions appear in a certain way to be actions that are designed intentionally to fall just under what NATO might describe as the response threshold. The point of which NATO would see this as something to which it would have to respond uh, in some much more forcible way than simply saying, well, we're going to impose economic sanctions or we're going to lecture people in the Security Council. Um, and so the question of what the inflection point of which there is going to be a response that meets what the ultimate goal is about is stymied by the fact that the methods that are being used to pursue it are not ones that seem to warrant the kind of response that the ultimate end point uh, seems to be about. The ultimate end point seems to be about the forcible annexation of territory of another state by conquest none of the methods quite seem to push you over that edge of saying, gosh, this is the straw that breaks the camel's back. And so I guess I would say that the notion that this is a highly integrated form of conflict that draws in these different spheres, methods, uh, all of these things is correct. But another way to look at that is to say, the integrated final result is something that you might consider to be unacceptable on a lot of metrics. And yet, the nature of all of these different pieces put together is that none of them, as they occur, is going to be enough to sort of trigger the response. Um, I don't know, by the way, what the response should be or ought to be or anything like that, but it does seem clear that, that there are these trigger points and that it's part of the calculation of the Russians on the other side uh, when it is that they were sort of pulling back in order to not trigger whatever that response would be. Now, that's the one that particularly within NATO circles I think tends to get discussed. But the other example, um, in many respects very, very different, couldn't be more different, uh, and yet shares many of the same methods and techniques would be the Islamic State, ISIS, ISIL, I'll refer to them all interchangeably, uh, in Syria and Iraq and now sort of spreading uh, into other places. And 
this is hybrid in terms of its methods in somewhat the same way, primarily in the reach to social media as a way of essentially mobilizing uh, people across a wide range, the use of modern communications technologies in order to provide encryption and, uh, and safety in communications and a whole series of uh, contemporary technologies in that way. And yet, when it comes to how it conducts itself, in one sense, yes, it is hybrid in the same way. The blending of all these categories together, particularly the mingling of civilians and combatant categories that, from our standpoint in law, is you know, the sort of core dividing line. Thou shalt not target the non-combatants. Well, there is an alternative out there, which is target all the non-combatants who are not of your religion or not of your particular um, faith, uh, grab hostages, chop their heads off on media, uh, engage in terrorist activities, uh, and in that sense, it looks really different from Russia. Um, hybrid in some very important sense, but this is not trying to go below your sort of um, reaction thresholds. Rather, what's being aimed at here is to challenge the basic legitimacy of everybody that might be considered its adversaries. And to say, this is not deviance on our part. We're not apologizing for it. We like doing this. We think this is a great idea. And we want it in your face as much as possible on the media on a global basis because this is a way of announcing that what our ends are partake of a completely different form and claim to legitimacy from what it is that we identify within the international system, international order, uh, some notion of the liberal rule of law, all of the things that we sort of bring to the table in thinking about what makes regimes and what makes the international system uh, legitimate in some way. All of this is directly a challenge to it from um, a millenarian, uh, apocalyptic, end of days uh, perspective that is irreducibly religious in character. Uh, so that it's not possible to understand what their claim to legitimacy is without understanding its reach to what somebody above and beyond or something above and beyond this world is, is called for. And in that regard, it couldn't be more different from Russia. So when the Russians are seeking to violate one of the most basic norms of international law, annexation by conquest, they are very careful to do so in ways that allow them deniability uh, and the uh, ability to sort of say, hey, us. Um, but they're very careful to do so in language that is going to at least on its surface, put them somewhere within the rhetoric of international law and the international system. They're going to march into the Security Council and defend what it is they've done or deny what it is they've done, but they're going to wind up using, in some sense, the language of international law, the language of normative claims from a system uh, that we understand and participate in. We regard this, I think, most of us as being in bad faith, but nonetheless, it's recognizable language and it's a claim to a recognizable form of legitimacy. Islamic State is not doing that. It's establishing its own claim to legitimacy and it is using that as a recruiting tool out to the world uh, in ways that, of course, participate in all the latest forms of um, communications technology. Now, those are not actually the only two examples we could add, although I'm not going to address them, I think. Um, the third paradigmatic example that I'm not going to discuss uh, at all would be, in some way, China in the South China Sea, the East China Sea, the North China Sea, the you know, West China Sea, pretty much any sea. Okay? Um, and in an important way, it 
two is, you know, territory is not quite the right word here, but I'm not quite sure what the term is when you're building yourself an island in order to plant your flag on top of it and say this is ours and everything, you know, in 10,000 miles surrounding it. Um, I'm going to leave that one aside because it too participates in hybrid warfare, the latest technologies, all of the rest of that, but I think also raises a set of uh, other questions about that. But let me point out in passing that, as with the other two, it raises questions about legitimacy. And it's not entirely clear where China would kind of fit itself, its actions at least in this case, uh, into claims of legitimacy, except to say that it's not attempting to sort of walk away in a sort of religious, apocalyptic sense from the international system, of course. Um, but at the same time, its sense of legitimacy about what it's doing is tied up with a self-conception about you know, what it's entitled to in the world. And so then a commonality between all these things, despite their various differences, and we also add to this Russia and Syria, which I think poses another series of conceptual problems for how one examines this. Um, we can wind up seeing a certain commonality as being all of these things are about claims to legitimacy in some way or other. Again, come back to that uh, towards the end of this. But I want to pause here for a moment and take up some of the criticisms that have been offered in the course of the discussions over the last few years uh, within kind of military and political and strategic and policy circles. One of them that strikes me as being very important is pushback on whether any of this is actually new. Right? So the idea that you use stealth provo provocateurs across the border, the idea that you prepare the ground in terms of propaganda, the idea that you use paramilitaries and that you mobilize, for example, your ethnic or religious um, uh, confrere in, in various places. Well, sounds an awful lot like what happened, say, in Czechoslovakia or in, in Czechoslovakia and um, uh, Second World War. All of that ground sort of prepared in order to eventually sort of you know, grab a piece of territory. So the question, in part, is what's new about this? I mean, I. Uh, when you go through the literature, you'll find many, many, many historical examples being offered in which practically everything that we describe as being these sort of fuzzed over, merged together, unclear, uh, boundaryless uh, categories of methods for accomplishing these political goals, you can pretty much find them across these historical things. Now, I not being much of a historian, I imagine there are lots of people out there, I tend to think of this in terms of, well, what did they do in The Princess Bride? Right? <laughs> and the Wally Shawn character, the inconceivable guy, they've snatched the you know, princess, and they're going to take her and kill her on the border with the neighboring country so that it will provoke a war, and then they'll be able to grab territory. Uh, so this is built into the structure of our fairy tales, like Hansel and Gretel or something. So it's important to understand then that all of these things have been pursued in various ways in the past. Um, and Ben Wittes, the very astute editor of the uh, Lawfare blog, uh, the National Security uh, and Law blog uh, run out of Washington, Wittes came away from a discussion um, at the Pentagon last year and wrote a little bit about it and said, I don't really see that any of this is actually new. It may be new in the sense that it hasn't been done recently, as the way that Russia has done is kind of an explicit um, way of conducting conquest, uh, or Islamic State, where it's unusual to find, I guess to say the least, uh, a non-state actor that is claiming probably not statehood in the sense that we mean it within our system, but something that definitely means governance. Right? Um, says, you know, that's not new, but what is the new element? And I think he quite correctly points and says, the new element is actually the internet. That it takes these various old techniques and makes them vastly more attractive as a package, particularly for a weaker adversary. Um, 
because, in effect, it ramps them up on steroids. Right? It gives them a sort of global reach with an immediacy that you wouldn't have found in any earlier time when you can just you know, open your cell phone and see right, the latest beheading on video. Uh, you can hear the preacher who is encouraging you to hear the call to um, come and join. You can hear the propaganda from um, the Russians urging ethnic Russians in this place to uh, essentially support um, paramilitaries and the rest that are uh, acting to move towards um, secession. Uh, all of this is ramped up and I think is genuinely new on account of the communications technologies that wind up driving this. And so I think um, Ben Wittes is very right in saying that if one is looking for responses, one of the places one's going to have to look is going to be what are the norms, what are the accepted laws, rules, the normative structure on which we view these communications technologies, social media, the ability to incite, arguably, whatever it is you like, uh, the ability to express oneself freely. And one of the things I'd note in this uh, that I think does affect the rest of the conference is the law and the legal structures that are involved when we consider these new kinds of technologies, particularly insofar as they're integrated with civilians, right? integrated with people who are not, um, you know, and I'm not speaking in a technical legal sense, but they're integrated with you know, society taken as a whole. Um, it involves many different areas of law, not just the law of armed conflict, not just the laws of war, not just international law. Uh, and so the responses that are driven by the fact that there are technologies that are enablers, drivers, and multipliers, force multipliers uh, in this space have to take account of a whole range of different normative structures as well. And I think that's absolutely right. But I want to broaden this out as I move to um, close here to suggest that we need to look at not just these hybrid tools as means by which you pursue certain kinds of ends. I think we actually also have to look and consider the ends themselves. What are the goals of conflict? What, are, what is it that the adversaries are seeking to accomplish out there? And to understand those in something like a hybrid setting, but I'm not sort of going to be wedded too much to that. But instead, let me go back and read a definition of globalization. At the very beginning of this era, uh, 1993, by a sociologist named Malcolm Waters, he defined globalization back in 1992-93, not long after the fall of the Berlin Wall, a moment in which... Uh, even I, as a pretty hard-bitten realist, shared a certain amount of, wow, happiness, right? The kind of coming of the new global order, everybody's going to live together, and you know, lions and lambs, swords into plowshares, um, all of the rest of that stuff. Even I had some feeling about that. Um, and he defined it this way at the beginning of this uh, era. He said, globalization is a social process, and social is, I think, really key here, in which the constraints of geography on social and cultural arrangements recede, and in which people become increasingly aware that they are receding. That is, the self-consciousness of the fact that these processes are taking place. Now, this is a striking definition. It's sociological, particularly in the sense that it's not so much looking to define globalization as, say, the economists would, uh, by defining it in terms of the drivers, these new technologies, the rise in global trade, um, all of these sort of things that essentially push to these ends, namely that the constraints on geography, on social and cultural arrangements recede. It's rather looking to the effects that those processes have and trying to sort of capture that in the definition. And I think that one can draw out of this a couple of things. One is that when we talk about hybrid warfare and the way in which it seems to participate in all these other spheres of life 
that are not, strictly speaking, they don't appear to be about warfare in the strictly conventional sense, in the separation of the conflict, the military, the people that fight, the tools they use, distinctly separated from the rest of society. On the contrary, they seem to run them all together. Um, and I think that that is actually part of the implications of this globalization, because the drivers, in this case, are fundamentally technologies that run across all parts of our society. It's one of the things that makes us vulnerable through the internet. Everything is run through the internet. And that means that conflict is going to be enabled across a wider range of activities. And it also means that responses are going to have to take account of the fact that the boundary lines between different forms of social, cultural, legal, political activities those are getting blurred and are disappearing. And it's not just on account of some adversary sitting down and saying, gosh, I wonder how I can achieve deniability for my aims, or ISIS announcing there is no border between Iraq and Syria. Those things are just constructs of this illegitimate uh, international order that we're going to try to um, attack. Um, but rather, it's built into the entire structure of globalization as a set of technologies that kind of moves across all these different areas of human life. We have vulnerabilities that are created on account of the boundaryless nature of this. Uh, and the adversary has ways in which they are able to use the fact that these things don't have boundaries and cut across all these areas uh, in which to use that as a way of fighting. Now, the process of globalization then means, in a certain sense, the erasure of boundaries. It refers here to geography, but geography is not just physical, it's also political. One of the effects of this process has been then that physical boundaries are reduced by improvements in technology, transport, all that sort of stuff. Um, but political boundaries with a globally self-aware population, the political boundaries between states, which however one sort of views the morality of and the obligations, for example, of Europe for refugees coming out of Syria, the descriptive fact is that the political boundaries don't matter to them except as sort of an impediment to getting over the border. Um, yes, they still matter. They may matter a whole lot more depending on how Europe responds to certain kinds of things. Um, but they're at issue and in question in a way that was not true um, not so many years ago. And in that regard, then, boundaries, borders, all of these kind of separation lines are under pressure. The categories are under pressure. Uh, in a geographic sense, in a social sense, in a political sense, uh, and in the sense that we define many important firm boundaries in the law of war, civilian, combatant being one of the most basic. All of those are under pressure. Now, part of the problem of response is the degree to which there's a push to reestablish those boundaries when they are being, so to speak, erased. It's very important to realize that the drivers technologically that our adversaries have primarily availed themselves of have been communications technologies. The traditional sociological drivers of globalization uh, have been seen to be um, transport technologies that have lowered the cost of the transportation of goods, and, and I will finish in one second here, um, and communications technologies. But the communications technologies are cheaper, more powerful. Transportation still costs something, and that is an area in which the traditional militaries still have an enormous advantage. Uh, I don't think that's going to change. And it leads me to suggest that the pressure has to be put and the way in which we talk about the rules governing communications technologies is actually key for the reasons that Ben suggested. Now, the last thought about this, about the ends of warfare. Um, the ends of warfare in this for the parties involved, first of all, are about the destabilization of the hegemon 
that is essentially underpinned the rest of the international legal order, political order, all the rest of that. The U.S. traditionally, across the post-war period, has had a role within the international system as a legal matter, as a political matter, but it's also been the sort of guarantor of security that stands outside the system and winds up sort of providing it with the guarantee that says somebody will provide rough political order, and that is not something that is captured in the words and on paper in the UN Charter. It's sort of an extra role. It's that hegemonic role that's under challenge by Russia, by Islamic State, by these other groups. But you notice that their ends are ultimately about what warfare is all about, which is governance. And it's seen most strikingly in the case of Islamic State, which is a very big step for non-state actor terrorist groups to decide that ultimately being terrorists, striking at a distance, hiding, running away, all of that is not sufficient as a political end. It is a transitional move, even if it's something that takes generations. And that the final end has to be the traditional categories of governance territory and population, including a territory and a population from which to strike those who you perceive as your enemies. And that is the crucial, I think, move from a strategic standpoint, which is to understand that the nature of counterterrorism is evolving into something that is merging together with geopolitics in a way that hasn't been true since 9-11. That is, we have to take account of the fact that the adversary is not just a terrorist group holding on to some tiny slice of land, hiding out in some place, and we then go looking for them, but rather they are deliberately grabbing whole territories, internal populations, and making fundamental claims to legitimacy of governance in ways that actually make it far more difficult for us to wind up striking against them. And let me close on that and just say, um, Brian Oren, the philosopher of the ethics of war, uh, wrote at some point, war is and always has been about governance. And our ability to confront a claim of governance essentially comes down to contesting legitimacy. They are contesting ours and the international order in many respects in which we are embedded. Uh, they're contesting us as a hegemonic actor. Uh, and for that reason, the law part of this, which is not the sum total of legitimacy, but a hugely important normative part of it, um, has to be thought through in the ways in which we are going to push back um, with claims of legitimacy of our own. Charlie, thank you. Thank you. I think Ken's done a wonderful job at setting, at framing the issues because it's, it's not simple. It involves technology, it involves globalization, and it invo involves some very big thoughts about the purpose of war. We're going to take our break now. Uh, you, you're going to have, because General Cathcart, the Judge Advocate General of Canadian Forces, and he's going to be buying many beers because of this, the weather was too bad for the Canadians to get out of there. <laughs> So, uh, so he won't be with us. We'll have a little bit more time during the lunch period to, but let's be back at, at uh, 914. <laughs>